Easy. Easy. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blundy Hacks. Today, I'm going to show you three ways to make square holes. So let's go. The first and most important question to answer is, do you actually need a square hole? Something that I learned managing engineering teams for many years is that people will spend enormous resources solving the wrong problem just because it was the first problem they saw. Here's a little fly cutter that I made many years ago for a specific operation, and it has a square tool bit in it, so it made sense to me at the time that I should make a square hole. And I did this with the first of the methods that I'll show you today. And it took a lot of time. And then years later, I did a similar thing with this grooving tool, and well, turns out, Whoever said you can't put a square peg in a round hole just needed to buy bigger drills. For a lot of operations, like this simple grooving tool, you can just make a round hole and the set screw that holds it in there, in this case it holds it in from the end, will hold it just fine. Another easy way to avoid square holes is to start with round tool bits. This is a spot facing tool that I made recently for a couple of operations. It's got a square tool grind on it, but as you can see the tool blank itself is actually round. That set screw in the end is enough to hold it square to the work. And it turns out it's a lot easier to grind a square profile on a round tool than it is to make a square hole. You can get as fancy as needed with this. This is an internal grooving tool that I ground entirely from a round piece of bar stock so that I could install it in this boring bar holder that accepts round shank tools. Once again, this was vastly easier than trying to make a deep square hole to hold this tool. Sometimes you do legitimately want a square hole. This is a line boring tool that I made for some pretty heavy cuts. So I wanted the square hole because it gives you much improved tool rigidity, and the tool is at a slight angle, as you can see, which simplified the tool geometry. Now, because the tool is at an angle, and it's being held in by set screws, the hole does need to be square, because otherwise the set screws are going to want to square the tool up to themselves. So the square hole in this case is holding it at the angle that I wanted. Alright, but you clicked on this video because you've decided you really do want a square hole. Of course, the single best way to do this is electrical discharge machining. Unfortunately, my EDM machine is broken, and I've been calling the repair shop for updates, but they just keep telling me the same thing. You don't have an EDM machine. Please stop calling us. Also, this is a pet store. You psycho. You just can't get good help these days. Here are two discs that I've drilled a pilot hole in, because many square hole methods start with a round hole. A drill is a very easy way to remove most of the material. Now we just need to square up the corners. First way we're going to do this is a way that you're not going to like. It's filing. You might think you should start with a square file, but actually it's quite a bit easier to do this with a triangular file. A triangular file gives you better control of the locations of the corners and allows you to refine each side without risking damaging adjacent sides. The key to filing like this is to take your time. Square up the file carefully when you start each section. And for the initial squaring up, I like to keep the stock stationary in the vise and file each of the four sides because it's easier to visualize the square corners if the piece is remaining stationary. If you take the piece out of the vise and put it back in every time you want to check your work, then you're going to lose your square reference. Now this won't be easy the first time you do it, and the first time you do it the result won't be click spring good. This just takes practice. There is a lot of skill in filing and there's no way around that. But go slow, take your time. You can improve your dimensional and positional accuracy substantially by scribing a square on the work before you begin. You can do that on the surface plate, for example, and that will really, really help. If you've got a line that you're filing to and you check your work frequently, you can get extremely accurate with filing and lots of practice, of course. When the basic square is established, I then like to switch to this file. I'm not sure what it's called. I don't know the names of all the needle files, but this has safe edges and a safe back. And this is kind of like an even safer version of the triangular file. You can get right into the corners to change the angle of a side slightly or enlarge it slightly without any risk of damaging adjacent sides or shifting your corners or deepening your corners when you don't want to. And listen, don't be afraid to give this a try, and don't be discouraged if your results aren't great the first time out of the gate. There are people on YouTube who make this look very easy, but it does take a lot of practice, but you can do it. Machinists have been making complex features of all shapes and sizes with files for 100 years. They did it, you can do it too. Now, I'm certainly not great at this. 
this hole is, you know, a little bit artisan. It's a little crooked, a little bit out of shape, but it uh, it's a square hole. And for most things, this is probably just fine. That would hold a tool bit just fine. Or if you're going to silver solder a square piece of stock in there for a model, it would look just fine. And this really didn't take very long. And again, if I had scribed the square on the piece before I started, it would look a lot better. I just freehanded it and eyeballed it for the purposes of this demo. For the second method of squaring up the corners of that round hole, we're going to use a square brooch. Just looking at these things, you can see exactly how they work. It starts with a round boss and some round teeth that gradually get squarer and larger as it goes up. Each tooth is doing the minimum amount of work to change and enlarge the hole slightly into the square shape that it needs to be. The little boss at the bottom tells you how big your pilot hole needs to be. Mine's a little bit too small, so I enlarged that. And you want that to be a very close fit in there because that pilot hole is what holds the brooch straight when you get started. You got to make sure that you've got enough room below the work for the brooch to pass through. These things can get very long. So you might need to have a hole in your bench underneath your press, or you can have a special press stand which has a cutout in it. Or for fairly small brooches like this, you can prop up the work a little bit to give you a little bit of extra real estate. The other important thing to know about brooches is that they take a lot more force than you think. This is a 3 16th square brooch. Up to about a quarter is probably the largest I can do on this little two-ton arbor press that I have. Any bigger than this, you're really probably going to need a hydraulic press. You also want lots and lots of lubrication. I'm using WD-40 because this is brass. It's a good cutting oil for non-ferrous metals. For steel, I'd be using Tap Magic or Rapid Tap. You really, you cannot use too much lubricant on a brooch. They need a lot of it. The more, the better. All right, now I'll bring down the ram and I'm going to start pressing on the brooch. And the key is that brooch needs to stay square, of course, not just so that the hole is square to the work, but so that you don't break the brooch. If you start getting crooked with the ram, which can happen, then it's going to start putting lateral force on that brooch and it's going to snap it. So you see me lifting occasionally, which allows the brooch to self-straighten. On an inexpensive arbor press like this, there's a fair amount of movement in that ram and you don't want it to be pulling that brooch sideways. But as you can see, I'm just working my way down. This is actually very satisfying. You can really feel each tooth cutting and it's a pretty neat process. In brass, it's pretty easy. In steel, I'd be pushing a lot harder and I would have the press bolted to the bench. When you get near the end, make sure you're prepared to catch that brooch with your hand or with something soft. You don't want it to fall to the floor or otherwise hit something hard because those brooches are expensive and you really don't want to drop one. That's the other downside to this method. Square brooches are spendy and you have to buy one for every size hole that you want to do. However, the result is very nice. As you can see, it's got very nice square corners and this is going to be extremely positionally accurate because it's exactly centered itself on the pilot hole that we drilled and it's going to be very dimensionally accurate in the corners at least. You'll notice there's these little scallops left over from the pilot hole, and that is a necessary evil of square brooches. The pilot hole is always actually a little bit larger than the dimension of the square, because otherwise the force to push that brooch through would just be too high. But like the filing, the square doesn't have to be perfect. This square hole, even with those slight scallops in it, is still perfectly fine for holding square tooling, or for silver soldering in a square beam, or whatever. However, if you really want to make the most perfect possible square, well, there is one other method we can use. I'm going back to the original stock for those discs. I haven't turned them out on the lathe yet for this third method. And I'm going to start on the milling machine by side milling my way down to the center of the piece. This is what you might call the cut and cover method, kind of like how they dig shallow subway tunnels. By side milling our way down to where we want the hole to be, we can create a hole with nearly perfect inside square corners, as square as the nose radius on our end mill, which is never going to be zero, but it's going to be very close. This method is also going to give us pretty much as perfectly dimensionally and locationally accurate a square hole as you can get, because we're doing this depth of cut with the DRO, and the end mill is going to be cutting an accurately widthed hole, so the resulting square is easily within a thousandth of size and position. However, here you see the limitation of this method. I've run out of depth on this end mill. This is also why I'm making this square larger than I did the other two, because I don't have any small end mills that can cut deep enough into the work to reach the location of this square. 
So that is a limitation. You have to be able to reach the location of the square from the outside of your part somewhere. In this case, I happen to have a long reach end mill that I'll swap in to get that last little bit of depth of cut I need to get to the center of this disc. However, these really long reach end mills are notoriously floppy and you can only take the very lightest of cuts with them. That's why I started with the shorter one and I'm just going to do the last couple of finishing cuts to get down to final depth with this end mill. The next thing I'm going to do is cut some shoulders that are right at the top edge of my square. So I've moved the end mill up by the size of my square and then I'm side milling a little bit, an equal amount on both sides, about 30 thousandths, just to give myself a little bit of a shoulder. And this is going to give us a place to set the piece down onto that we're going to use to cover over the top of our square. Here's where we're at so far. You can see three sides of our square at the bottom, and then there's the little shoulders at the top of our square that our filler piece is going to sit on. So let's get on to that filler piece now. I've got this little piece of square scrap that I'll use for the purpose. I'm going to square up one end, and this end is going to be the finished inside surface of the top of our square. Then I'll mill two other sides of this piece parallel to each other and down to a very close fitting dimension on that slot that we cut at the top of the square. This needs to be as accurate as you can get it, but as you can see I only need to mill three sides of the piece. The two long sides and then the short side that will form the top of the square. Because the rest of these sides are going to be machined away in a final cut. But that is a really really nice fit in there. The better that fit is, the better this method works. To attach that piece, I'm going to use Loctite 680 in this case because it's brass and it's just a demo. That'll be plenty strong enough, and in fact Loctite 680 properly applied is stronger than an interference fit. But you could also braze it, you could weld it, you could screw it in, you could pin it. Lots of different ways to attach this little piece, just depends on the application and the metal and so on. For many, many cases, Loctite 680 is going to be just fine. The key to getting maximum strength is surface prep, so everything's been thoroughly cleaned with acetone. Allow that acetone to evaporate. And then I apply the Loctite to the two faces that are going to be fixing this piece into the blank. Now once that's in there, I'm going to wipe off the excess because Loctite is anaerobically curing. So any of it that's blobbed out into the air is never going to dry out. It's just going to make a mess forever. So we'll clean that off of there. Then it's really important to give this enough cure time before the next step so that you have some strength in there. I always give it at least 15 minutes. 20 is better. If you don't have enough strength, then the finished machining that we're going to do over here on the lathe is going to break that bond. Once it's had 24 hours to achieve full strength, then you'll never break it loose again. I'll start by facing down that piece that's sticking out on the front. The reason for doing it this way, rather than trying to machine the block to the perfect size ahead of time, is that you're going to get a much better surface if the piece is oversized and then you machine the two surfaces together in one final cut as you see here. This is always going to give the best result. No matter how well you machine that little block and try to line it up perfectly, you can get it to look good but it's never going to look as good as if the two surfaces are cut in a single pass. You can almost make those seams completely disappear doing this. Same for the OD, which is why I had not yet turned the OD of this disc like I had for the other two methods that we showed. I left this all raw stock as long as possible so that we can do all the finished machining with the filler block in place. And once again, that's going to make the seam on the outer dimension of the part virtually disappear. Here you see how it's important, of course, to mill deep enough into the piece so that we can get the thickness of the disc that we want out of it. But now if we've done our math right, when we part this off, it's going to be a flat disc with a perfect square all the way through it. I'll pause part way and break the corners, of course, with a file. This parting operation is going to be a bit interrupted because we've got the remnants of that milling groove flying around. So I'm parting off a little slower than I otherwise would, especially when I get near the center. A square hole spinning around a parting blade creates some pretty weird forces. And Yahtzee.
The detritus that's left behind from that is pretty interesting on the stock, but that's okay. What matters is what we got left with, and that is this beautiful little disc with a very nice square hole in it. This method, I think, is just about as perfect as you can get with manual machine tools, but of course this method took much, much longer than the other two and did use two machine tools, as opposed to the first one which used zero machine tools and the second one which just needed a little press. So that's how machining goes. The more perfectly accurate and pretty you want something, the longer it's going to take and the more expensive the tools get. This third method was used for both of the parts in this letter punch fixture jig thing that I made several years ago. I really wanted perfect inside corners on both of these, so this is the method that I used. On the stainless steel piece on top, I used Loctite to seal the piece in, and on the brass piece, I used pins to seal those pieces together. But as you can see, there's really no limit to how nice you can make that with careful machining. There you go, three methods for square holes. There are other methods, of course. You can use rotary brooches and EDM machines and other fancier methods, but for the home gamer with simple machine tools, it's really hard to beat these three methods. Which method you use depends on how much time you want to spend on this, how perfect it needs to be, what tooling you have, and so on. Hopefully there was something in here that was helpful. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this happen every week, and I will see you next time.